Okay, we think we're going to wait another minute or two before we get going. Make sure everyone who wants to attend is in here. Okay, we're now at uh, 733 Pacific time. So I think we're gonna get going. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes, you yep. sound good. Perfect. Okay, let me share my slides. My name is uh, Anne-Marie Cody from the SETI Institute, and I'll be hosting this splinter session today on um, how we may use test observations to leverage the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Okay. So I'm gonna give a, a brief overview uh, before we hear from our other panelists. Um, just to kind of get some of you familiar who may be not so um, uh, not so aware of what's going on in the SETI world. Um, so let's let's get going here. You may have heard mostly of um, SETI searches being done by radio telescopes, and uh, that is certainly something that's ongoing. But um, we're going to focus today on how we may search for life elsewhere in the universe um, in, uh, at optical wavelengths and specifically with the test satellite. Um, so there are different ways to search for life elsewhere in the universe. And uh, in general, there are these two complementary pathways, which are biosignatures um, and specifically looking for um, molecules or other forms of life, which may be not so advanced single celled organisms, basically anything um, by analyzing data from known exoplanets. Um, and for example, studying uh, their atmospheres um, with upcoming telescopes like JWST. So those are focused on biosignatures um, and hopefully um, there will be, there will, there already are some promising exoplanets discovered by tests around very bright stars that are amenable to those kind of biosignature searches. Um, but we can only follow up on a relatively small number of um, exoplanets with bright host stars for biosignature searches. So what we're gonna to highlight today are um, these complementary technosignature searches where technosignatures is specifically looking for signs of life from much more advanced um, civilizations. Those that are actually capable of um, either sending out signals to communicate or um, uh, building structures as we're gonna see um, that may be detectable by us. So in terms of techno signatures, you may be most familiar with um, SETI searches for radio signals coming from um, other stars and planets. And that is something that's been going on for decades by, um, for example, my colleagues at the SETI Institute. Um, and, uh, but search for extraterrestrial intelligence has also moved into the optical um, for example, there are ongoing projects starting up at uh, Lick Observatory looking for um, optical pulses that again, um, advanced civilizations might be sending out in turn as a form of communication or otherwise using lasers. But that is actually not also not what we're going to focus on. Um, what I will highlight today is how we can use the test satellite to look for occultation events specifically due to um, artificial structures in orbit around other stars. So that's kind of a brief overview of 
different ways we might um, approach SETI. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll see how, um, how tests can be used um, in a complementary way to these other methods. Um, so why on earth are we looking for occultations? This is just kind of a, a fancy, almost uh, sci-fi depiction of what we might envision as, um, as being out there. Now, of course, we have no knowledge of extraterrestrial intelligence as at this point, but it can be hypothesized that um, if you have a civilization that becomes, that is uh, extremely intelligent, it will have high energy needs. And at some point, the energy available from the home planet is no longer sufficient to power that civilization. So as it becomes much more advanced, it may actually want to harness energy from the host star itself um, by building structures or a network of uh, panels or other objects that can receive energy from that host star. Um, and so this introduces the idea of uh, Dyson spheres, which you may have heard of, and other related structures like Dyson swarms, Dyson rings. Um, and the basic idea is that you have a series of objects in orbit or sometimes stationary um, around the central star. And if those objects are moving and uh, they pass through our line of sight, then they will periodically um, occult the central star. So down here on the bottom, you're seeing a simulated light curve of a structure that um, passes in front of its host star and does not look like other types of uh, astrophysical variability. We're gonna hear more about simulations a little bit um, later in this uh, from another uh, panelist, Joshua Bromley um, in this splinter session. So, we are somewhat motivated by the discovery a few years ago of a Boyajian star, which appeared um, in the Kepler mission data as an object with pronounced fading events. We now believe that those fading events are caused by some form of dust around this star, but it did kind of spawn ideas that uh, if there could be one of these uh, Dyson swarms or some other form of uh, so-called megastructures in orbit around the star, could, it could produce similar types of uh, fading events. Um, this is a very rare object. There have been some other oddballs found by Kepler in its K2 mission, such as this one dubbed the random transitor, where there are fading events that do not uh, phase up nicely like an exoplanet would. So the, this has raised the whole question of, um, would it be possible to search around a larger sample of stars to look for the signatures of objects in orbit that are not um, uh, natural, such as planets or uh, comets? So could there be additional anomalous variable stars waiting to be discovered? And that is the question we seek to answer. And the great thing is that TESS is really enabling this by looking all over the sky. Uh, Kepler had a relatively narrow cone search space. And of course it looked during its K2 mission at a larger swath of st uh, stars in the ecliptic plane, but still was not all sky. So Kepler, including K2, looked at about 500,000 target stars of which we have basically one anomaly that sticks out, the Boyajian star. TESS, on the other hand, um, as we heard early in the conference, has about 300 million full frame image targets. Um, so that is really a huge number and that expands our ability to search for um, techno signatures in the form of occulting events. So, um, well, we're going to be hearing from some of the people in my group. Um, we have a NASA exoplanet research program that has been funded to look through the first two years of test data for occulting uh, megastructures. These are some of the folks who are involved, along with a number of students, uh, some of whom you'll be hearing for shortly. Um, and the basic approach is that we're going to take the test FFI data for roughly 60 million stars. Um, we have produced light curves 
uh, from the Eleanor pipeline. And we have a lot of complementary data on those 60 million objects. What we're exploring in this splinter session is how we can use statistics and machine learning methods to identify anomalous variability, basically behavior that stars may show that cannot be explained by astrophysics. So we're focusing on the first two years of the mission for this particular project, but we can certainly expand it. Um, it's just a matter of uh, data storage and, uh, and expanding the analysis to include um, more tens of millions more stars. So our goals are to either detect a transiting megastructure indicating extraterrestrial intelligence or put this one of the strongest constraints to date on their presence around main sequence stars. Um, we could provide potentially promising targets for those radio searches that I mentioned. And we're also looking for um, astrophysical occultation events like comets and dust, which are interesting in their own right. It's uh, we're basically looking for a needle in a haystack, as you might, <clears throat> excuse me, imagine. And we're going to hear in this splinter session um, from several a number of people who are listed here on how we might um, on how we are currently approaching this search for occulting megastructures in the test data set. So finally, um, I'll talk a little bit about the follow-up. We're going to hear from uh, Joshua Bromley about um, how we might model interesting individual sources, variable sources, to figure out what the origin of that uh, flux behavior is. We have time on multi-band ground-based facilities. Um, if we do find something interesting to assess the color behavior and, uh, and anything we find that seems uh, non-astrophysical will be passed on to the radio telescopes. Okay, so that's all I want to say for now. I want to jump right in, and um, I will mention that we're primarily going to save questions for the very end when we have some time for discussion from the audience, so do start putting your questions in our SETI with TESS Slack channel. Um, so we are going to hear next from um, Jeroen Audenart about how we might start classifying the test variability using the, the TADA pipeline, which, uh, by the way, there is also a um, talk about in the main session. Take it away, Jeroen. Thank you, Anne-Marie. So yeah, uh, my name is Jeroen Audenaert, uh, and I'm a PhD student at the Kai Leuven Institute of Astronomy, based in Belgium, and I'm specifically working on machine learning. Today, I will talk about how we can use a combination of supervised and unsupervised learning in order to detect uh, stellar variability subclasses, so including anomalous types of variability. Now, here you can see um, an, uh, an image of the actual test data for astro seismology pipeline. Tomorrow, I will detail the full pipeline a bit more in detail, but today my focus will be uh, on the second level uh, classification, as you can see on the bottom. So the image consists of a top level and a second level classification. And in the top level classification, we do a general classification of variability types. So we try to find uh, transiting planets or eclipsing binaries, pulsating star, and a lot of others, as you can see over here. And we mostly do this using a supervised uh, learning algorithms. Now, in level two classification, we try to find subclasses among these high uh, level uh, general uh, variability classes. And we specifically do this using unsupervised clustering methods. Now, the benefit of using unsupervised methods is that we don't, we're not bound by any previous knowledge. So we can find substructures without biasing the classifier necessarily. And this really allows us to, on, on the one hand, detect subclasses within these general variability classes that we already know, but also take a look really at new classes of stars that have not previously been discovered. And here I will focus mostly on the methodology of how we can actually do this. Now, the benefit of using um, uh, unsupervised learning is, of course, that we don't uh, need a lot of training examples, but we can just see where exactly these clusters are found, um, and we don't need to give them any labeled examples. Now, we're using the F-Optics clustering algorithm as, an, as a, our unsupervised learner, and this is a hierarchical density-based clustering algorithm. F-Optics is an extension of the well-known DB scan algorithm. 
And what I mean with density based is that the algorithm goes and look, looks in the data space and searches for over densities that are present in there. So here on top, you can see on the left, uh, the uh, scatter plot where the clusters are indicated in color and the noise is indicated in black. And the algorithm goes and searches for the for over densities in the parameter space. And rather than actually giving us an exact assignment, F optics gives us an augmented ordering of the clustering structure. Now, this might seem a bit fake, but this is what you can see on the bottom. And the output of F optics is a reachability diagram. And this is really the, the clustering structure or um, visualized in a 2D plot. So it doesn't matter how many dimensions we're using as input. We just always uh, get a reachability diagram that is in 2D. Now, the X and Y axis on the top axis on the top plot are just uh, uh, yeah, uh, data that we generated, so they're uh, non they're not real data. And, and, and in case we want to apply this to actual variability catalogs, what we do first is we characterize the light curves in some ways through certain parameters. So, for example, uh, we take the skewness of a light curve, which is very good for eclipsing binaries. Uh, or we take the first frequency or the second frequency, and this is then the input to our clustering algorithm. Now, moving back to the bottom left plot, we see the reachability diagram here, so the visualization of the clustering structure. And the clusters that are found in the data space are actually translated into valleys in this reachability diagram. So you can see that each cluster, although there's still quite a lot of noise in the plot, is translated very nicely into a valley. And it doesn't matter how exactly the cluster is shaped, the algorithm is really able to pick that up nicely. And F optics is also a hierarchical classifier. So this, so this means that it finds the hierarchies among clusters. And this is really well visualized in the second uh, or the right part of the plot. So here you see that although there, are, there, there is one big cluster, it consists of smaller, uh, of three smaller clusters. And this is visualized in the bottom plot where you see one big cluster. And then if you look very carefully, you see that from zero to 400, there's another cluster that belongs to the larger cluster from zero to 800 as well. And then we see another smaller one uh, next to that. That's really a power of uh, F optics. Rather than just giving us an exact assignment of the cluster, which we do in k-means, but this means that we really need uh, to know in k-means, for example, how many clusters we have. Here we really visualize the clustering structure without the need to actually have too many parameters. So that's really uh, nice. And this can allow us to find new type of clusters that are actually anomalies within these general variability classes that the data pipeline has found for us. Now, to show you an example with actual light curves, here, uh, this was done for Kepler uh, Q9 data. I think it was 27.4 day data in order to mimic the test light curves as good as possible. For one of the subclasses here, you see the reachability diagram and a star on average in the cluster looks like what is shown on the left. So you see, this is what the light curve looks like. And on top, you see the amplitude spectrum as well. But we also see that there are a couple of clusters here, so smaller clusters, and this is what we see on the right. You see that the, the light curve looks, looks different from what we can from the other one, the more uh, basic ones, um, and also the amplitude spectrum. So really, F optics is able to find these clusters. Now, cluster extraction is also an important point because, these, as I said, the clusters are indicated as valleys in this reachability diagram. But of course, going through all of these manually takes some time. So therefore, we also have a cluster extraction algorithm that goes and looks at the gradients and then finds the inflection points. And therefore, that gives us a rough, a rough estimate of where exactly clusters are found um, within, the, within the plot. So this can auto help us automate it a little bit to make uh, our discoveries uh, happen faster. Now, to recap, we really combine the power of supervised and unsupervised learning. So we first do a high level classification of, um, yeah, of the variability classes. And then based on each of the classes of interest, so we take, for example, eclipsing binaries, we then run an unsupervised clustering algorithm on that, more specifically F optics. And this allows us to, while at the same time using the knowledge we already have about variability and the general classification scheme, still actually undo uh, a, a characterization of the uh, substructure without any biases and have the potential to really discover new classes that could be an indication of 
uh, extraterrestrial lives, for example. But also one of the side, one of the nice things here is that we can also help us in identifying misclassifications that happened in other parts of the pipeline as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeroen. Um, I don't see any questions in the Slack channel, but we will get to any later. So if you think of anything, put them in there. I believe Jeroen has to run to another splinter. So uh, tag him if you have a specific question for his talk. Great, we're going to move on now uh, to a presentation by Marley Rapp on uh, the statistical selection of fading events in tests. Take it away, Marley. All right, so I am Marley Rapp and I am an undergraduate student at the University of Michigan, as well as a summer SETI Institute RU student. So I'll be talking to you about the statistical selection of fading events and tests. So just to remind y'all, um, techno signatures, which is what we're ultimately looking for, are signs of technology from intelligent extraterrestrial civilizations. So we're looking for these in the forms uh, in the form of anomalous fading events that we can see in light curves. And um, as an example, Boyage and Star, who Dr. which Dr. Cody touched on, is an example of some anomalous fading events that um, provoked further investigation. So it's a good example of kind of what we're looking for. So the project objectives here are to find statistical trends in light curves with known fading variable variability, such as transiting exoplanets, eclipsing binary star systems, um, young stars with um, dusty rings still. And then we want to identify anomalous variable stars using these statistical, um, using st statistical selection based on these trends within these known ability stars among the test data. And um, eventually, if we find anomalies, we would flag them for follow-up investigation from ground-based observatories, as Dr. Cody also mentioned. So as far as the methodology, we're using a statistic that we call M, um, and it takes the difference between um, the, top, the top and bottom 10% of the light curve, which in this plot is shown in red, and um, the overall median of the light curve. And so the top, so in this light curve, you see that the, um, the, dip, the mean between, the mean of the top and bottom 10% is the lower black line here, while the overall median is the higher up black line near one right here. So we take the difference of these and um, divide that by the overall root mean square of the light curve. So the higher the M value, the more um, fading there will be in a light curve. And if um, it's over 0 0.25 about, we assume we can safely say that there's probably some visible significant fading events. And here we have an eclipsing binary where you can see the secondary and primary transits with a pretty high M value of 1.16 about. So, um, in our preliminary results, we see some system, systematic errors affecting the M values. So these are all sector nine light curves, and we can see that there's um, some artificial dips caused by scattered background light that causes um, pretty consistent artificial dimming throughout this sector. So we had to remove some affected time ranges, and this varies per sector. So they, we can see that there's some artificially high M values that can kind of throw off our results. So after doing this, we um, after removing those um, time ranges, we can um, look at the M statistics again and um, pick out some anomalous looking stars. And this is one example that has an M value of 0.627, which is pretty high. Um, and we can see that there is a almost 50% dip here. And so it's taking the difference between the overall median or between the mean of the top and bottom 10%, which is low line and the overall median dividing by the root mean square. So that's giving us our higher M value um, because of this giant dip. So this is the kind of weird stuff that we're looking for essentially. And this is one of the example of, examples of one of the weird objects it brought up that warrants further investigation. And so some of our next steps is to keep improving and fine tuning our data filtering, such as um, finding either better ways 
to um, get rid of some of those bad data points or just extend what we've done to other factors. Um, and then we also want to acquire the M statistic value for more stars and be able to um, select and find more stars with significant fading events that have um, high M values. And we can use that and compare um, the M value with other statistical features such as the amplitude of the fading events or um, the periodicity if there is any. Um, so we can find kind of clusters of stars and see if there's any outliers that could be anomalous. And if we do find any anomalies, we can flag them for follow-up like um, from ground-based observatories, like I said earlier, and, um, and do a deeper dive investigation. So yeah, in summary, we're looking for techno signatures specifically in the form of anomalous fading events using the M value, which helps measure the amount of fading or dipping that we see in the light curve compared to the overall trend. And we can identify some anomalies, hopefully, and do a follow-up investigation on the interesting behavior of some of these stars. And that's it. OK, thank you, Marley. <laughs> Um, as a reminder, put any questions you have for her in the Slack channel and we will get to them at the end. So we're going to get more into um, machine learning techniques now, and we're going to hear from Alex Parcels on uh, how to classify test variable star light curves with machine learning. Uh, yeah, you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, yeah, hey everyone, my name is Alex Parcells. I'm a uh, undergraduate student intern with Berkeley SETI Research Center, and my project is on, uh, like Gamer you said, classifying test light curves of variable stars automatically with machine learning. So for the past uh, eight weeks, I've been working on building and improving a machine learning classifier to categorize stars into different classes of astrophysical variability automatically based on their test light curves. And so that's work that historically was done by hand, but people have been doing it automatically for a while now. Um, and you probably know that there are features you can look at in a light curve that can help you identify what type of variable star it is. So here's an example of an eclipsing binary light curve. And you can see that there are primary and secondary eclipses of different depths and they repeat periodically over time. And so that is uh, helpful when you're doing this by hand, but those kinds of things can also be helpful when you're doing this automatically. And so, this work is uh, in conjunction with an anomaly detection pipeline that Daniel Giles is going to talk about later. And uh, so I won't steal anything from him, but you know, his pipeline is designed to identify basically anything that's weird. So that could be rare variables. It could be new types of variables. It could be things with SETI significance. Uh, and so this work dovetails nicely with that because we can feed in light curves into his pipeline, find out if they're weird or new, and then if there's anything that comes up with a really uh, uh, comes up as really weird, we can then put that through this classifier that I'm working on and see does it uh, get classified with high confidence or does it not? And if it doesn't get classified uh, with high confidence into any category, then that might be something we want to look more at and do follow up observation on. But so let me tell you more about the classification side of this. Uh, right now, I'm working on a reduced classification problem, which is just, uh, is this light curve an eclipsing binary or is it not an eclipsing binary? And so I have about 2000 light curves from each category, eclipsing binaries and uh, non-eclipsing binaries. And those are from test sector 14, which is the sector that Kepler primarily observed in. So I filtered those by magnitude. And then I also filtered them recently by eclipse period time. Uh, and the reason for that is because you can see on the right here, uh, a long period eclipsing binary like this one, which has a period of 36 days, uh, within one 27 day test sector, you might not even be able to tell, you know, you might not even get a full period. So here you can see that although this is an eclipsing binary, there's no reason that a model would classify it as an eclipsing binary because it only has one dip. Uh, so filter that out. And then I featureized the light curves using a package called cesium, which is good for featureizing time series data for machine learning. So I'm using scikit-learn to build my classifiers. So far, I've used three different classifiers, a support vector classifier, random forest, and a k-nearest neighbors. And so if you have any questions about how those work, you can ask me after. But um, I'm also recording different performance metrics, so classification accuracy, precision recall, and a few other ones. 
Um, but so the workflow for the uh, model training is really that I use this standard five-fold cross-validation. I do a grid search over the hyperparameters, so the different things that can be optimized, uh, that can be tweaked, sorry, to optimize your model. And then for the best models, I log all the metrics to uh, software called weights and biases to help me keep track of them. As you can see in the upper right here, this is just an example of a grid of hyperparameters that I searched through for my random forest classifier. And so you can see I'm basically trying every combination of these. So let me get into the results. Uh, currently, the classification accuracy, or at least until recently, in the best case, was hovering around 0.8, so 80%. Uh, um, but recently, after removing the long period eclipsing binaries, that's gone up to around 0.83 for all three types of classifiers. And so uh, the precision and recall are typically in the same range, although they've gotten up to 0.9 in the best case. And then the area under the ROC curve, which is another good metric, has gotten up to 0.91. So obviously there's a lot of room for improvement, but uh, the improvement that I noticed after removing the long period eclipsing binaries is interesting. You can see on the right here, these are two confusion matrices uh, for the K nearest neighbors classifier. The top one is from before I filtered out those long period binaries. And the second one is from after that. And you can see, especially in the bottom left corner of each plot, there's a lot of reduction in the number of false positives. So that's um, exciting. That being said, there's definitely a lot that can be uh, done to improve the performance of the classifiers further. And so my next steps are going to be fine tuning some hyperparameters because there's still a lot of parameter space to explore. I want to try some custom features, including the M statistic that Marley mentioned, and also experiment with a neural network. Uh, An autoencoder is what I'm going to try using. So this is just a diagram I included to show uh, that they are good for using uh, for automating feature extraction because they basically find what's the least amount of information you can represent your input data as such that you can still reconstruct the output, which is exactly what featureizing is supposed to do. Um, and then uh, beyond that, I'm going to hopefully expand this to other areas of the sky, and then we'll eventually add in other variable types to the classifier like flare stars. So that's the state of the project and here's some references. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Okay, um, we'll talk here a little bit more about uh, machine learning uh, in two talks from Daniel Giles. And from now, we are going to have Tansu Dailan talk about uh, existing exoplanet targets and how we might search for strange transits around them. Go ahead, Tansu. Thanks, thanks, Aaron Mary. Thanks for organizing this session and for the invitation. So I will be talking about um, uh, an anomaly detection pipeline I've been working on recently. And I think this is a great session to present this uh, in. Although I'd say that the pipeline is more generic than SETI searches because um, there is one object that we think is relevant to this type of search, which is pl uh, circum planetary disks, but let me first get to the idea. So the idea is to look for anomalous transit features in time series photometric uh, data, such as that we get from TESS, uh, also applicable to Kepler, because you do definitely need high precision sub PPT level, as you will see very shortly. And the idea is really to look for any features, especially during the ingress and egress of any planet, uh, to try to figure out if there is anything weird with the shape of the occulter, the transitor. And uh, I will get to the details of what that means very shortly, but let me first motivate this. So here you see two pictures. The picture on the upper right is from uh, Saturn. I think it's an HST image uh, from uh, two years ago. And you see the rings A and B and the Cassini division in between. So um, we, th we know that such rings, uh, circumplanetary rings and dust, um, uh, dust rings actually exist in the universe. And more recently, the picture on the lower right is actually very, very recent measurement from ALMA, Bennett et al. 2021, that made headlines very recently, which is showing the, um, the accretion disk around uh, PDS-70C, which is a very young 5 million year, year old uh, planet 
uh, at its formation, essentially. So we know that um, such disks are also very likely to exist out there in the universe. So we just need to be looking for them, especially those that transit. Um, and if we cannot explain the, any, uh, the features we find with uh, disks, I think it would be a natural question to ask whether they could uh, indicate any megastructure that is artificial. So coming to the discussion of near exoplanet or objects, what I'd like to call them, there's the obvious exomoon stuff, but they're not in phase with the uh, planet motion around the star. So I will skip that, but I will focus on those that are in phase with the rotation of the planet. There are two things you could consider. There is the circumplanetary debris disks that I just described, uh, potentially due to tidal disruption of objects, or there could be artificial kilo structures. I'm particularly uh, uh, avoiding the term megastructure here to say that these would be necessarily planet size, not uh, Dyson sphere like objects, but basically things that just trail uh, or lead the planet or maybe around the planet and uh, add to the shape of the planet and change it in one way or the other. You could essentially think about placing these uh, at uh, cost-effective uh, places like the Lagrangian points, um, uh, but uh, that's again outside the context of this particular work. So here is just a picture of how a transit looks. On the y-axis you have the relative transit and then Basically, uh, I'll just make a reminder that at the bottom, we have the limb darkening going on. And typically we would like to call the uh, time uh, where the relative flux starts decreasing until we get to see the um, actual uh, effect of limb darkening, the so-called ingress. And the other one is so-called egress. And uh, the shape of ingress and egress is very important. So recently I wrote some code to do a dynamical photodynamical modeling of uh, such transit events and try to estimate the light curves associated with these objects. Um, so uh, for example, here you see three such perturbations from a disc-like shape. On the left, you see a face-on disk. On the, at the center, you see a horizontal edge on disk uh, on the planet or around the planet, I should say. And on the far right, you see a vertical edge on disk. These are all objects that uh, absorb light perfectly. So they produce essentially sh um, uh, perturbations. They produce perturbations to your otherwise smooth light curve. And then the next question is uh, to see how, uh, what these shapes look like. For example, for a face on um, transit, there's an early kick in and then some modification to the ingress. And then basically, so the gray lines here denote the uh, beginning and the end of ingress ingress and the beginning and end of the egress. And here you see that there's a late and uh, uh, there's an early and late uh, kick in as well as for the egress. Um, for the um, horizontal edge on disk, the uh, features are less pronounced. And for the um, vertical edge on disk, it's minimal. And in fact, outside the ingress and egress, there is no much perturbation to your light curve. So if you look at the relative flux, you get this picture. Now you can see that the face on uh, one is the highest one. So it is then natural to basically look for deviations from your usual transit model around the beginning and end of the ingress as well as the beginning and end of the egress especially so if you have a face-on perturber. If it's edge-on, especially if it's vertical, you have not much hope. Uh, if it is um, edge-on and horizontal, you may have some hope of detecting it, but it's still about uh, less than a PPT part per thousand. And it's if it's face-on, obviously depending on the size of your ring, you might actually get a, de a detection. I will just remind you that these um, features are very short. So you have to uh, keep in mind that the photometric precision of tests uh, is usually quoted in units of per hour. So if, for example, you're looking for a feature that's only 10 minutes, you're really um, eating down the photometric precision. So typically for typical stars, we are talking uh, a PPT or so for the photometric precision during these features of tests. So 
basically the metric that I wanted to introduce was the base, uh, basically the mean or relative uh, mean deviation from the light curve in the uh, um, right in the beginning of egress uh, and uh, ingress and at the end of ingress and egress. And if you basically um, start uh, estimating this for all known transiting planets, you might eventually find out that there's a perturbation or a deviation from the usual transit uh, model expectations. And that was what I wanted to check. So what I did basically was uh, use the orbital uh, priors from the exoplanet archive, then just uh, um, refreshed the ephemerides by just floating the epoch, then modeled the, transiting, uh, the transits just using um, uh, the transit tools I have basically just with no perturbations and then estimate their so-called rim anomaly uh, by using the metric which is essentially the difference between the mean uh, deviation uh, at the beginning of ingress and at the end of egress, uh, ingress as well as uh, at the beginning of uh, egress and at the end of egress. So essentially this gives you two metrics per light curve phase folded light curve, I guess, um, to work with. So this is just an example. Uh, this is one of the recent TOI detections, TI 1233. So first uh, I model it so that there is no residual or mostly there's no residual left. And then um, after these um, uh, modeling is performed, we feed the residuals into this uh, anomaly detection metric and uh, make a histogram of those. Uh, across all known planets that are uh, detectable by, uh, by TESS. And this is the distribution I got. Basically, this shows ingress and egress metrics separately. And um, uh, blue is egress and uh, red is ingress. And um, the typical expectation is that this should be roughly a Gaussian distributed random variable with a standard deviation of about uh, um, a, a PPT. And that's mostly correct. So if you just look at the core of the distribution, you're happy and you can just call it a victory and go home. But the issue is there are actually a lot of outliers too, if you just zoom out the, of the distribution. So this uh, has been basically bugging me for a while that I want to understand why uh, we are getting these outliers. And I checked them and they mostly look like, um, here's a quick list, uh, either um, that the uh, ephemeris uh, refreshment is not working perfectly or that there's stellar variability. And when there are huge variations, much larger than a PPT, then your detrending um, algorithm might suffer. And then that causes some um, additional noise. And finally, systematics, just in case, for example, your ingress or egress fell uh, basically very close to the beginning of the orbit or the end of the orbit. So um, these are still working investiga under investigation. And I just like to conclude by adding one more thing. Uh, in fact, that's, that was actually mentioned in the title, which is Mergen. Mergen is our unsupervised classification and anomaly detection pipeline uh, that I have been developing with two students, Emma Chickles and Lindsay Gordon. Uh, Emma is in fact coming to MIT as a PhD student and will continue to work on this. And um, its main application is actually uh, classifying stellar variability, but I have also been employing it to, um, to see if we can produce um, uh, features using the convolutional autoencoders to uh, come up with better uh, features than the estimate, uh, the estimator that I just described, the difference between the uh, beginning and end of egress and ingress. Um, and this is work in progress. So hopefully we will follow this work up by using Mergen on the system and uh, try to uh, make sure that we have no outliers. If so, uh, I think this is worth looking into further. Thanks a lot for listening and uh, happy to take any questions at the very end. Okay, thank you, Tansu. Um, we'll have to move on now. And uh, we're going to hear from Daniel Giles about uh, anomaly detection using machine learning methods. Hello. Um, you can see my screen OK? Just need a nod or a yes. Yep. All right, great. great. Um, 
Hello, thank you for joining us. Um, these have been some great talks so far, very interesting. Um, I'm going to talk to you about technosignatures with TESS, um, our NASA XRP funded work to find um, hidden stellar cultures, which may include, um, you know, something that we've never seen before, maybe a, a transiting megastructure, maybe none of that, maybe we'll just put some limits on it. But um, we are looking and hopefully we'll find something worth talking about. Um, let me start by highlighting um, kind of the remarkable discovery of Voyage and Star. So not necessarily Voyage and Star and all of its grandeur, we've talked about that before, but like the discovery process of Voyage and Star was originally an object of interest in the Kepler data as a planetary candidate and it took the combined eyes and interest of a lot of citizen scientists to first notice that these dips were weird in the first place. Um, and then it took a lot of community discussion. Uh, they elevated it up to the attention of the quote unquote pros who um, made a nuanced observation that if a megastructure exists, it might look something like this. Um, the media frenzy that followed that uh, statement did not take that nuance into account and said, astronomers discover uh, aliens. Um, but, you know, uh, it brought a lot of attention to SETI searches um, and it was, you know, a very interesting discussion to have. So this is just one example of so many amazing discoveries that have happened simply because somebody was looking at data, they scratched their head and they said, hmm, that is weird. That is odd. That's not something I would expect. And there's just this huge, long and storied history of such discoveries happening uh, all throughout science, um, especially in astronomy. When we look at something new, when we look with new instruments, we find new things. And with big data, it's simply not feasible that we could look through all of the data. So we might be missing some of these types of discoveries. It's We have more data that can possibly be looked through, at least by human eyes. Allow me to generalize a bit about the discovery process at large. Um, so this is a plot of everything, both known and unknown. On the right, we have all of the stuff um, that we still have yet to discover. And on the top right, we have everything that um, we would expect to find, everything that we know what form it might take, um, everything we have a model for or that's popped out of an equation, something that is a consequence of some other type of exploration. Um, into the theory of what's going on in the universe. So gravitational waves, for example, were theorized 100 years ago, and when the technology caught up, we were able to look exactly where we expected to find them, and lo and behold, there they were. This is good and important stuff. Um, I don't want to detract from that at all. Um, it's really important. I mean, it's how science is done. Top left, also important. We know about things, but then we want to know everything there is to know about those things. We continue exploring it. We have a target of interest. We look at it until we know way too much about it. But I would argue that this bottom right corner has been just as instrumental to the discovery process throughout scientific history. Um, when we look for everything that we know about, everything that we're expecting, we also come across data that we don't know about and it advances the field. And I would also say that it has been taken for granted that these sorts of discoveries will happen simply because we're looking at the data. But as I said before, with the amount of data that we have, this simply isn't feasible. We can't look at all of the data. Um, and what we do in order to look through the data, to analyze the data, even if we can't look through every single piece of the data, is to do some data analysis um, using machine learning in particular. So I'm going to generalize to the point of your responsibility here and say that machine learning approaches in astronomy have fallen into two broad categories, those of supervised machine classification approaches and unsuperv unsupervised machine learning approaches. For the things that we know about or know what form that they'll take, um, the top part of this plot, the known knowns and the known unknowns, we can either use existing data or we can use simulated data to train machine learning algorithms to uh, know what the correct answers should be and category, categorize new data into the existing categories. The supervised part of this is that we train the machine learning on data that has the correct answers, the answers that we know to be correct. This is really, really effective. Um, it's so effective, in fact, that I think it can create this sort of tunnel vision because all of the irrelevant data can be effectively ignored. This is essentially the point of it. You don't want to know about the other data because it's not relevant to what we're studying. But when we're looking for the unknown, 
when we're trying to discover things, we can't impose that sort of limitation. Anything could be out there and we don't know what form it might take. So we just don't know how to look yet. We have to use machine learning, which doesn't impose that sort of limitation. Um, and we have to use unsupervised machine learning, which doesn't learn from correct answers, but rather learns from relationships within the data itself. So if we're going to be learning from the relationships within the data, we have to talk about what type of data we're looking at. Um, so we're looking at test data. Um, and previously, we looked at Kepler data. So this is a Kepler light curve. We have changes in brightness over time. For variable objects, what we're interested in is how these changes in brightness happen. Um, so we can parameterize a lot of the features that we see in a light curve, um, either the spikes, the dips, the shapes um, of the activity, also periodicity, uh, a lot of different features of interest which describe some physical process happening um, for the source. And so if we have these uh, features and we reason and we suggest that they're connected to physical models, uh, physical mechanisms, then it stands for reason that weird features or a weird collection of features corresponds to some weird physics, or at least physics we haven't seen before. Voyage and Star itself was notable because it had weird looking dips. Um, someone noticed and then a discovery was made. So all we have to do is conceptualize the process of discovery and distill it down so that a machine can do it. How do we go about doing this? Well, like any good project, we've got a flowchart. Our approach is centered around anomaly detection. Um, I use anomaly detection and outlier scoring kind of interchangeably, but those two ideas, the idea of finding the weird stuff, we're looking for weird stuff. Uh, it's essentially the crux of it. Um, so we use anomaly detection to highlight the strangest looking light curves, um, indiscriminately strange, just anything that looks strange. Effectively, this pairs down the data space that we're looking for interesting targets. If we're specifically interested in weird looking occulters, then we can look at this smaller uh, subset of anomalies, everything that's anomalous, and look specifically for the weird occulters. We can use more computationally intensive methodologies to analyze the data once we've kind of pared down the data to only the interesting stuff. We can essentially mimic this process of discovery that uh, occurs when you get the right eyes on the right data by making sure that we get the right data at least um, into this anomaly subset. So talking a little bit more about the outlier scoring that we do, um, uh, we've heard about, if you've been with us the entire time, we've heard about uh, density-based scoring. Um, so we use a density-based approach. Essentially, we take all of those features we calculated based on the light curve, put them into a 60-dimensional feature space, and then we see what objects are near to each other. We don't explicitly cluster, but essentially the idea is that objects will cluster with like data. If they are not part of a cluster, then um, we consider them to be strange, some type of outlier. So in this two-dimensional um, visualization that I've got here, it's a reduction from that 60-dimensional space. We can see the two axes of the most variance. And um, while this isn't what we technically do, what we can do is essentially draw a circle around all of the clusters and say everything within the cluster, normal, everything outside is weird. So inside this little densely packed cluster, we've got about 3 million of the light curves from sector nine. And outside, we've got 100,000. Um, so darker points are more outlined in this plot. Um, so 100,000 uh, objects is a lot more easy to analyze with more computationally intense, with more eyes. Um, it's a lot easier to analyze in depth 100,000 objects versus 3,100,000 objects. Um, and that sort of analysis falls into a lot of the other talks that we've heard about from some of the students who have been at um, SETI and at Berkeley. Um, it can also be analyses that we're not specifically doing. So um, it could be we provide these outlier scores to the world at large and everybody does their own analyses as they like. But um, the sorts of things we've been doing, um, we're doing classification like Alex Purcells was talking about. We calculate those more computationally intense metrics like the M statistic that Marley Rapp um, gave a talk about. And uh, as Joshua Bromley will talk about for the most interesting individual anomalous uh, dippers, we can model uh, exotic transit signals with something um, that isn't necessarily natural in origin. 
this is all well and good if you trust that I have successfully pared down the data to only the interesting data and that what is left is actually interesting and that we haven't missed anything in the, um, in the 3 million light curves because we're getting rid of a lot of data. Um, so in order to illustrate this, I'll uh, bring up this plot from some earlier work I did on the Kepler data. And um, as a proxy for uh, the, of, of scoring, like what, um, how does, how does scoring perform on rare objects or objects we've never seen before? Um, I look at uh, how score corresponds to rarity of known variable classes. We have a bit of a dearth of um, ground truth where we have like things that have actually never been seen by people before. Uh, essentially by definition, we can't say that there is like a ground truth for that. And for the things we have like Boyajian star, we have maybe, um, one, like we can count on one hand the number of things in the Kepler data and the test data um, that have never been seen by anyone before. Um, so corresponding rarity to uh, anomaly score, we can see that this, uh, this lines up pretty well. So we have uh, the weirder something is, the less common it is. So the less objects in a class, the weirder it appears to be, except for semi-regular variables, which um, in this Kepler window, um, they didn't exhibit a lot of variable features. Um, they have a longer period of variability. Um, but aside from that, we can see less objects corresponds to weirder scores. Um, so this is good. And also I would highlight that this, there are a lot of different types of variables represented here. A lot of different types of variables have weird, have similar outlier scores. Um, so there's uh, this outlier score doesn't necessarily discriminate on the specific type of um, variability. It's all about rarity. And since the things we're looking for have uh, presumably never been seen before, uh, we can stand to reason that they are uh, fairly uncommon. Um, looking at um, some of the light curves themselves, we can see this sort of all of these different variability features encoded into this outlier score. So these are a couple of the outliers from um, actual test data. Um, so these are from sector nine and they just show, I'm just showing them to illustrate that like we have a lot of flaring activity. We have what might be rotational modulation or um, some type of, of slower periodicity. Um, as well as some type of transits and pulsations. So there's a lot of different information encoded into these things. I haven't specifically looked into what each of these specific objects actually is. So if that isn't the behavior being shown, uh, just pay attention to the behavior as opposed to the classes I um, faked to say right now. Um, but there's a lot of information. There's a lot of variability information encoded into that outlier score. So the outlier score isn't the end of the story. Like I've said, there's a lot of additional analysis that needs to go into this. Uh, I'm not going to get into that today, um, but uh, for now we are in the process of calculating the anomaly scores for 60 million light curves from the test full frame images. Um, that's the first two years, um, sectors one to 26. Um, and from there, we're going to further analyze those anomalies. Um, our research group, as, uh, as mentioned, is primarily searching for those exotic stellar cultures. Um, so we're focused on those weird looking dips. But as you've seen, the anomalies are rich with, with variables of all types. Our scores uh, can serve as an ideal place to start many variable research projects and tests. So if you're interested in any type of variable object in the test data, um, please feel free to reach out and uh, collaborate. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, we started a couple minutes late, so we actually have one more very quick talk left that we're gonna jump into right away. And that is by Joshua Bromley, who's just gonna tell us about if we find something, uh, how to, simul how to uh, figure out what it is or how to simulate what we might find. Okay, Josh. Okay, can you see my slides? Yeah. Okay, so hello, I'm Joshua Bromley. I'm an undergrad at UC Berkeley and an intern with the Berkeley Study Research Center. I've been working with both Daniel and Anne-Marie at simulating occulting structures. And so the motivation of this, uh, our, main, our main motivation of this is that an advanced extraterrestrial intelligence could build a megastructure around its host star. 
this megastructure could be of an unnatural shape and therefore its transit would be unnatural of an unnatural shape and different to everything that we've seen before. And so to discover these ETIs, we would need to be able to differentiate between natural transits and transits from artificial objects. And so the goal of this project was to generate artificial transit or transits, hypothetical artificial transits to explore capabilities of detection and differentiation. So the first part of this was to generate light curves from occult. So our process was to generate a shape uh, inspired by uh, an Arnold paper from 2005, such as this long rectangle. We would then use the 8-bit transit package, which was created by uh, Emily Sanford and David Kipping uh, in 2019 to generate a transit. Now to search for this transit in the context of all the stars, we would then inject the transit into a test light curve, uh, such as this image. Uh, and the parameters we chose to explore for the different occulters were the size of the occulter, which is also the depth of the transit, the length of the transit, the number of sides of the occulter, such as three versus four, uh, the rotation of the occulter, such as if it was pointing the other direction, the stretch, which is the ratio of the X and Y dimensions, if it was longer like this. Additionally, we explored uh, several of the same objects, such as this, and them having different separations, such as this. Now, here is a subset uh, of one of the data sets. You can see uh, all these triangles here and moving across you can see how they each varied slightly differently in their stretch and moving downward they each vary slightly differently in their rotation. Um, these are the um, transits uh, that correspond to the occultors from the previous slide. You can see they each, um, some of the light curves have different signal to noise ratios and this is because uh, we injected these transits into a variety of different test curves as to, again, simulate a search from a wide, wide field of stars. The second part of this uh, project was to determine the shape of an occulter from the light curve. So we used a, a Markov chain Monte Carlo sampler, and we had a model that assumed the occulter was fully opaque and an ellipse. And so from this, uh, we could determine both the X and Y dimensions of the occulter, as well as the length and location of the transit. So this graph shows the data in black, as well as the um, truth curve from 8-bit transit in blue. And then the samples uh, pulled from the sampler are in orange, showing the, po uh, the possibilities of the light curve. And then this graph shows the corresponding shape that was predicted. So we have the true shape, which is a rectangle, and then the predicted shape, which is kind of this amalgamation of ellipsoids. The, on this graph, the darker the orange, the darker the yellow is, the, uh, the more times it was predicted that the occulter would take that space. And the fainter the yellow is, the fewer predictions that the occulter occupied that space. The results from uh, these uh, transit generations is that all of the transits of a significant depth were detectable as anomalous. However, this is to be expected as a wild as in a wide field of stars, both variable and not variable, mostly not variable, the ones that are variable will stand out. However, there needs to need to do more investigation, more in-depth statistics to see whether we can differentiate them from natural transits. As for the result of the uh, sampler, they, the sampler can correctly determine the size and the length of the transit as well as its location along the curve. However, it does have some issues determining the proportions between X and Y correctly, as you saw in the previous slide. And so I would like to thank my mentors, Daniel Giles and Ray Cody and Steve Croft. And if anyone has any questions, you can please put them in the Slack. Okay, thank you, Joshua. Uh, we are finished with our talks and we have gone a bit over time. So I think uh, people are probably gonna be jumping out now. Um, I see a couple, just a couple questions in the Slack, which I think we will uh, have to answer in writing since we uh, went over. So we will get to those. And I have been asked to uh, remind everyone that in about 10 minutes, um, there will be an off topic talk on the Juno mission, which is in uh, room one. So if you have any questions about the talks that you heard today, do put them in the Slack and we will um, do our best to answer those. Thank you for joining us today and uh, 
thank you again to all of our speakers uh, for giving us some great talks. Okay, bye everyone. <laughs>